Um, we should get underway. We've got about um, 30 people in climbing. Um, so Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Koto Katoa, everybody, and welcome um, to this webinar. Um, bright and early in the morning in New Zealand and it, presumably at various other times around the um, rest of the world. Um, this is webinar is being jointly hosted by the Faculty of Law at Victoria University of Wellington and the Centre for Labour Employment at Work at the, at the university. So um, on behalf of Tehera Walker, Victoria University of Wellington, welcome to the webinar. Um, I'm Gordon Anderson, I'm a professor um, of labour law in the law school here, um, and I'll be the host for the session. Um, just a couple of um, housekeeping points before we get underway. Um, first of all, um, if you could all keep your microphones on mute, that would be great. Um, we'll also leave the um, chat function on, um, and if people have any questions or comments, obviously they can put them there. Um, we weren't planning to have a sort of open um, question and answer session um, at the end, but if there are questions, if you have a question, put it in the chat and we'll see how many we can get through those in the um, time available. Um, so with that, let's move on to today's topic, which of course is about the um, status of workers bill in the United Kingdom. Um, and what the uh, webinar is intended to do is allow um, our speakers to give some sort of um, introduction as to what is going on in the United Kingdom, um, which has progressed a little bit further than I thought actually. Um, and obviously it's a debate that's um, of importance in a great number of countries as to who's an employee, who's a worker, who's a contractor, who's whatever new form of employee they've thought up um, since last evening. Um, but in New Zealand, we have a tripartite working party looking into this question. So um, what we're going to hear is particularly um, useful, I think, for that sort of ongoing debate. So can I introduce the um, speakers for today? The two main speakers, uh, first of all, um, John Hendy QC, um, who's a, a leading uh, labour law barrister um, and has a long and distinguished career, both politically and legally, um, in labour law and I saw on his thing was described as the a barrister champion of the trade union movement. Um, I think John's appeared in just about all the main litigation over the last several decades in the United Kingdom, so he's particularly well placed. Um, the other principal speaker is Professor Keith Ewing from um, the Dixon Poon School of Law at King's College. I'm sure Keith is well known to most of you. He's um, one of the United Kingdom's leading labour lawyers, also, of course, human rights and a number of other areas. Um, Keith um, started off in Edinburgh University and is now at King's College by way of Cambridge, Moss, Monash, Osgood, and a whole range of um, various other visiting um, appointments. Um, and probably importantly, Keith and John, um, along with Caroline Jones, um, were the main editors of the 2016 Manifesto for Labour Law, um, where these proposals originally developed. Um, and the um, Institute for Employment Rights, of course, is um, pushing a lot of these type of proposals. And I was interested to see they're also doing um, fair pay, um, which is also a focus in New Zealand. Um, but also at the, I'll, I'll introduce everyone now and get that out of the way. We have two New Zealand um, commentators, Peter Kiley, who's a founding partner of Kiley Thompson Casley and one of our uh, leading employment lawyers um, with over 30 years. Um, Peter's website says that he has uh, probably the only lawyer who has um, practiced under all the pieces of industrial legislation since the 1970s. Um, prob probably I'm all about the same age as Peter, um, but I've also been teaching under all four. Uh, and of course, was, um, when I was at university, we still had the old Industrial Conciliation Act. Um, just to make it clear, this isn't a preliminary for the International Day of Old Persons um, tomorrow. We also have um, Gail, who's um, the um, 
legal advisor with the New Zealand Council of Trade and Unions to sort of represent the up and coming generation of lawyers. So on that note, I'll turn over to John. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Gordon. Uh, thanks for inviting us to uh, speak to the uh, seminar. It's uh, an honour and a privilege uh, to do so. So the, the topic this evening is the Status of Workers Bill, which was introduced as a private member's bill into the House of Lords by myself, and which had its uh, second reading in the House on the 10th of September of uh, this year. Gordon, I've put the text of the bill on the, uh, uh, or a link to it on the uh, chat, if anybody wants to uh, look at it. The, the way that uh, private members' bills are chosen in the House of Lords is by ballot. Every time there's a new government, they have a ballot for 25 bills. And uh, just by chance, I happen to get uh, chosen. So uh, that's, uh, and then I chose this particular subject because it's a relatively simple one. And because, as you rightly say, through the work of the Institute of Employment Rights, of which I'm the chair and Keith is the president, we had formulated a sort of transformational program of uh, reform of labour law. And this was probably, I think, we, th we, we think the third most important uh, limb of uh, those proposals. If you want to know the first, it is, of course, the reintroduction of sectoral collective bargaining, what you call fair wage agreements. The second most important was the is the introduction of a Ministry of Labour, which was abolished by the Tories in our country. So just to restate the problem that the bill is intended to uh, address, it is the problem that different status uh, workers of different status are entitled to different uh, lists of employment rights, statutory employment rights. They're also entitled to diff different uh, ways of ta being taxed and paying national insurance and different uh, amounts. But the bill doesn't really deal with tax and national insurance. So it's directed primarily at reducing to a, a single status for all workers other than the genuinely self-employed and therefore entitlement to all statutory employment rights from day one of their engagement. And it, it addresses the, the fact, the well-known fact that employers seek to apply the lowest possible status in order to bear the cost of the least possible rights for their workforce. And this is a very long standing problem. It certainly goes back to the end of feudalism, if you want to put that in the 16th or 17th century, when agricultural workers in particular had a fixed status depending on their, their attachment to the land and to the feudal lord and uh, so forth. But with the growth of capitalism, of course, it's workers assume different status, and many, many workers. Uh, became either employed by the day, hence the term journeyman, based on the French jour, which, which means day, or by the shift, or even the half shift, or down to the hour. And by the end of the 19th century, many, many workers, millions of workers, were employed simply on an hourly, uh, hourly basis. So the problem ha has been one which has been magnified in more recent years by outsourcing, by privatization, uh, which always leads to the diminution of terms and conditions and therefore employers seeking ways in which they can reduce terms and conditions. One of which of course, is to reduce the legal status of their workforce. Magnified in particular, by the destruction of, select, uh, of, of sectoral collective bargaining in our country from uh, a, an, a, a, an average coverage of collective agreements from about 85% uh, at the end of the Second World War right through to the uh, middle of the 1970s, 
the coverage now is around 25%. I personally think it's lower than that. I think it's somewhere between 20 and 23%, but it's whatever it is, it's less than one in four workers now covered by a collective agreement. And of course, collective bargaining was, the, was one of the principal ways of ensuring a firm status and decent terms and conditions for uh, workers. Of course, the problem has been a, 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 the subject of many, many cases in the uh, courts from the landmark case of the ready mix in our country in the ready mix concrete case in the middle 60s but very recently we've had a series of three supreme court cases dealing with the way in which contracts uh, are to be construed in a way favorable to the best better status of the workers those are the auto cleanse case, Pimlico plumbers, and the uh, Uber uh, case. And most recently, I've done a case in the Court of Appeal for Deliveroo uh, riders, which um, deprived them of the right to collective bargaining on the basis of their employment uh, status. I, I, we can discuss that if we need to uh, later on. We've, we've lodged a petition to the... Um, Supreme Court, but I don't know whether we've got permission yet on that uh, case. This, of course, is a, a f familiar problem all around the world, and the ILO uh, has pronounced upon it many, many times, saying that workers are not to be treated less favourably in relation to the conventions of the ILO based on whatever status they're given by national uh, law. And the same is true of some of the international treaties such as the regional treaty in, in, in the European Social Charter, where the European Social Charter, in, in a case that I did on behalf of the Irish Congress of uh, Trade Unions a couple of years ago, held that the right to bargain collectively is one which uh, the self-employed workers shared with all other kinds of uh, worker. But in the United Kingdom, the problem is particularly bad because we have at least three state high of work workers. The European Union is a bit, bit better than that. Everybody recognizes that this is a major problem in Britain. We had a review by uh, a re review a few years ago that I think Keith is going to say something about, which didn't come up with much of a solution. Anyway, uh, the solution that uh, I've proposed uh, in the uh, House of Lords is one which uh, I fear is likely to be doomed to failure because uh, when we had the second reading, although the bill was supported by the Labour front bench, by across the cro what they call the cross bench peers, by former senior members of the judiciary, by the bishops, uh, and by many Tory backbenchers, it was opposed by the uh, government. Uh, and we'll have to see uh, what happens at the next stage of the hearing. I haven't got a date for that uh, yet, but I, I'm not terribly optimistic uh, about it. Now, I just want to say something about the bill itself. It, it, it's not possible, or you guys may formulate something, but I haven't found it, and my colleagues... 24 professors that worked on this in the Institute of Employment Rights have not found a golden formula to draw a line between self, genuine self-employment and all other forms of, of uh, work worker. We felt that it was necessary to preserve as a separate status genuine self-employment for many, many uh, reasons, historical, political economic uh, and so on and into that category of course uh, i needn't expand in to the in amongst this audience barristers owners of non-platform taxi cabs independent house painters authors gigging musicians and so forth and so on genuinely self-employed take their talents to many many clients or customers uh, uh, and um, nobody would dream 
that they were entitled to holiday pay for uh, any from any particular uh, uh, customer. But there will always be a grey area, always a difficulty, because lots of workers, of course, have got several employers. Cleaners might do a shift for one employer in the morning and another shift for another employer in the afternoon. But something has to distinguish them from being employees to being ranked as self-employed. I did a case in the Court of Appeal a few years ago for a lap dancer who worked in a, uh, a number of nightclubs, uh, predominantly in one. It's called, the case is called Quashy and Stringfellows. Now, I could, but basically, I can't see any reason why that uh, dancer shouldn't have been ranked as a, an employee of the club. The, the real difference was that that she worked for other clubs as, uh, as well. That, that's not the basis of the judgment, however, but that that is really, it. if she'd only worked for the one uh, uh, club, that, that might have been uh, enough. So there's always going to be a gray area, a, a, a difficulty. We've made it easier because in this bill, we've said that the burden of proof ought to be on the putative employer to demonstrate that the worker is is self-employed rather on the worker uh, having to prove that uh, she is uh, not self-employed. The bill also deals with uh, another difficulty, which is these personal service companies. They, they Labour lawyers give them different names. Sometimes they call them umbrella companies or um, whatever, but I've, I, I've called them in the bill personal service companies. This is the one person company where um, if I go and ask, uh, ask to be taken on to do work, the employer says to me, yeah, certainly you can work for me, but I require you to set up uh, a company, John Hendy Limited. John Hendy Limited will employ John Hendy and John Hendy Limited will have a commercial contract uh, with me. And the consequence of that is that the real employer is insulated from all the employment rights which an employee would have. And my only remedy, having all those employment rights, is against myself as John Hendy uh, Limited. Now, some work professionals do genuinely have personal service companies uh, to limit their liability and for insurance and tax purpose and, uh, and so on, which we didn't want to e extinguish. So the difficulty there has been to draw the line between the genuine personal service company, which is reflective of genuine self-employment, and the abusive personal service company where the employer is, is simply uh, uh, depriving the worker of any meaningful right to uh, employment rights. Now, if, if you look at clause two, five, I've set out the, a, a basis on which that distinction is drawn. I'm not sure that it's really absolutely cast iron, but it is a basis of, 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 uh, of doing it. The last element of which is that the third party for whom the labor is or was to be performed is not in practice that of a client or customer of the professional business undertaking carried on by the worker or the employee. There are other elements as well that the real employer should have some control over setting terms and conditions. But it seemed to me that that was at least a tenable basis to draw this difficult distinction. The bill also deals with another category of worker, which is only present in Britain, and that's what we call the Lim B worker. This is a, a worker who has a contract with an employer, but the contract is not a contract of employment, as, as it would be known in the, to the uh, common law. So these are sort of intermediate uh, people who have some of the rights of an employee, to national minimum wage, paid holiday and so forth, but not all of the rights. So they can't claim, for example, unemployment. Uh, they can't claim unfair dismissal uh, and so on. So the bill would completely demolish that, that uh, this uh, 
subcontract uh, subcategory of uh, workers the the employers have managed to get some of these workers mostly gig workers these are has the employers have managed to get some of them on side by telling the workers that in order to preserve the flexibility of, of work that they enjoy the workers enjoy and of course the employers do too uh they need to be these uh limby workers of course that's completely fatuous because under a contract of employment you can have equal flexibility if the employer is prepared to concede fle fle flexibility so that it's a nonsense argument but it's one that's gained traction amongst some uh, gig work workers and the other issue of course is a tax allowances because the Limby workers are a class for tax purposes are self-employed. They can claim tax benefits for the purchase of uh, capital equipment, such as Deliveroo riders claiming for their motorbike or pedal bike or whatever. I mean, the, the, what they claim is an absolute pittance. And of course, it doesn't deal with a real problem, which is this equipment ought to be uh, provided by the employer. So if they're decent collective bargaining and could exercise collective force, it wouldn't be a question of claiming an allowance for their capital equipment. It would be a, a question of their equipment being provided for them by the uh, employer. So, Gordon, that's a brief outline of the bill. I am, I'm very conscious that it, it only scratches the surface of the many associated problems with uh, categorization of workers. It doesn't, for example, deal with the issue of zero hours contracts, where you've got total flexibility on the part of uh, workers and a, um, a resort back to the casualization, which was so uh, common in so many industries, which we eradicated finally in the dock industry in the 1940s but which has come back into the docks and of course has been rampant in the construction industry for uh, many many uh, many many years which the unions have never really beaten in uh, in in construction it doesn't also deal with the issue of which hours are to be paid this is a, a an issue which the supreme court touched upon in the uber uh, case where you've got gig, gig workers do they are are they entitled for example to the, the national minimum wage or to a rate for the hours that they clock on or is it only for the actual journeys that they uh, make we, we we see identical problems with domiciliary care workers which in britain now are commonly only paid for the 15 minutes that they're allowed to dress the old person in their homes or give them breakfast or whatever it is, but not paid for travel between the, their, their engagements with the uh, um, old people or people in need to whom they provide their uh, serv services. And of course, there are many other industries where you've got these gray areas. A lot of this would be solved by sectoral collective bargaining, as it was when we had it in the agricultural industry, which specified a separate rate for waiting time, for um, standby time, for night work, for uh, sleepovers, and all that sort of sort of thing. All that should be provided for by collective uh, bargaining. But this bill doesn't doesn't resolve those issues, but it does tackle a, a fundamental uh, one. And finally, uh, Gordon, let me just say this, that you'll see if you look at the bill, it, it addresses the problem by making alterations to two particular acts of parliament. But our legislation, I, I suspect like yours, has got a multitude of uh, acts of parliament dealing with different aspects which are which are um, uh, relevant to labor law many of them with different definitions of what a worker is so for example we got a different definition of worker 
in the whistleblowing le legislation, um, a different uh, a, a definition for other purposes as well. So this bill is really uh, very partial, but it does attack a fundamental um, issue. And it, uh, if even if we fail with it, at least we've highlighted that something has got to be done uh, to confront this problem. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Um, just before um, I ask Keith to speak, could I just remind um, people who are listening in that if they have a question or something, if they could put that in the um, chat function, we can uh, look at those once we've heard from the various speakers. Um, so um, we'll move on um, and hear what Keith has to say now. Okay, thank you very much, Gordon, and uh, thank you for inviting us to uh, join you tonight as it is here, and thanks everyone for um, looking in. Uh, I think just to follow up from what John said, I think this is an issue that um, requires a lot of uh, humility uh, when trying to think of uh, solutions. I mean, there are many, many people who worked on this uh, for a long period of time, and we are still trying to uh, find a, a solution. Uh, having said that, I think I mean, my understanding is that we were here to try to contribute to a debate that may be taking place uh, in New Zealand as it is elsewhere, uh, and uh, to say something about uh, what is happening in the UK uh, in relation to this uh, particular uh, problem. So what I'll do is, I mean, I, I may go over some of the things that John has already said, but I just I tried to put into context uh, some of the problems that we have uh, and why we think uh, we need to change and what we think the direction of change uh, should be. So the first thing is then just to look at the, the model, the, the British model, if we want to call it that. Um, and I think... Our system is unusual in the sense that, as John said, we've got uh, three different uh, statuses which operate within the uh, employment field. Uh, one is the uh, status of uh, employee, which is the traditional uh, person who works under a contract of service, a contract of employment, which is deemed to be a contract of service, which takes you back to uh, the old uh, common law uh, cases. Uh, the second is the, uh, as John said, the intermediate uh, status, which I think is um, referred to in the legislation as a worker. And the worker can be either, uh, so an employee is the first, the worker is the second, the worker can be either an employee or uh, someone uh, who is engaged in a contract personally to provide uh, a work or or labor or services to work or labor to a uh, another party, provided the other party is not a client or customer uh, of the individual in question. So in a sense, it's trying to broaden out uh, the protective function of uh, labor law beyond the traditional uh, definition of uh, employee. And if you look at the Uber uh, decision in the Supreme Court, uh, you will see that there is some uh, account of the historical origins of the concept of worker in British legislation and in that case the judges I think uh, track it back to the uh, 1970s uh, and uh, uh, guide us through the development and expansion of the use of this particular uh, concept. So that was the second, so we've got employees uh, which will be recognisable probably the world, world over, we've got this uh, idea of a worker and within that the uh, intermediate status that John referred to uh, and thirdly we've got uh, the uh, self-employed and in terms of uh, what this means in practice is that the employee uh, gets the full benefits such as it is of the suite of uh, employment protection legislation uh, that uh, we have uh, so that would be um, you know, the minimum wage, uh, working time, uh, unfair dismissal, redundancy, uh, and so on. Uh, the worker, uh, in the sense of the worker, the person who provides 
um, who's not, who undertakes personally to provide uh, a, a work uh, to someone who is not a uh, client or customer who otherwise would fall outside the scope of uh, the definition of an employee, that individual gets a gets a limited protection in the sense that uh, in particular there would be protection for uh, the national minimum wage uh, and the working time in the sense particularly importantly of uh, holiday pay but not uh, a range of other things like unfair dismissal uh, and uh, redundancy payments uh, and a range of other matters as well so in a sense the workers who for the, the people who fall within this uh, intermediate category get uh, less protection than the people who would be defined as employees. And of course, at the bottom of the pile, the genuinely self-employed uh, get uh, very little from our, no, don't get nothing, but they get very little from our uh, labor law uh, system. So basically you've got this group, I mean, the hard group for us uh, in recent years has been this group between uh, the, what might be referred to just for, for, for shorthand purposes as a genuine employee on the one hand, and the genuine self-employed on the other, so people who might be thought by some uh, to occupy a position whereby they have aspects of employment and aspects of self-employment, and if you fall within that intermediate category, then there are some benefits to which you'd be entitled, but not all benefits uh, to which uh, you would be entitled. Now, the slight problem is that we have this threefold classification for employment purposes, but our tax regime only recognizes two categories. That is to say, uh, employee, if, you know, for, for shorthand purposes, employee and self-employed. So, uh, so you might be uh, you know, the intermediate category for uh, employment purposes, but you would probably be, well, self-employed, I guess, for uh, uh, tax uh, purposes. So for some people, it is thought, as John, John suggested, I think the benefits are probably greatly overrated, but they, they're seen to enjoy some employment benefits, but also some uh, tax benefits. But these tax benefits are probably exaggerated. So that is, in a sense, the kind of legal context. It's interesting, I think, that I, mean, I get a sense from colleagues in some other countries that there is an interest in, in adapting. I don't know if this happens in other anywhere else, but. Uh, I do get a sense from some colleagues that there's an interest in borrowing uh, the British model and uh, the creation of the, this third category, this intermediate status, and adapting it to national labour law systems of other countries as a way to resolve the problems that they uh, currently face. Now, in this country, what has happened I mean, the, the, the immediate, I guess, uh, political context is that uh, we've two, two things, I guess. One is that we had a, in 2017, a government sponsored uh, review, which was chaired by a guy uh, who had been Tony Blair's uh, chief of staff, I think, when he had been uh, prime minister. Uh, and uh, he was appointed by the then conservative uh, prime minister, Theresa May, uh, to conduct a review of modern working practices. He produced a report, um, I'm not sure it was universally uh, received with universal acclamation, but uh, he received, he published a report in 2017. Uh, the government uh, has yet to uh, take any action uh, in response to it. And it looks to me as if that report is just going to wither on the vine. We've got legislation promised by the government, but nothing has come. Now, the on the question of employment status was one of the issues which this report uh, uh, examined, uh, basically uh, what the review recommended was, was that we should leave things pretty much as they are. We should retain these three different uh, statuses for employment purposes uh, as they currently operate in the United Kingdom, but that there should be greater clarity to distinguish between the three different uh, 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 categories of status, because one of the problems as you can imagine, is that there is great confusion as to which category a different group of workers might fall. Uh, and in particular, this intermediate uh, group has been one of particular uh, problem uh, for us uh, in, in recent years. So the recommendation was that there should, we should stick with this threefold categorization, but there, should, but there should be, in a sense, statutory regulation of the employment tests uh, which would create greater clarity so that people could predict with more 
certainty, the, the group within which uh, they fell. Well, that's easier said than done, I think, uh, for reasons which uh, John explains. And uh, not only has there been no response to this recommendation, but I've seen it reported uh, in some, some of the press earlier this year. And I don't know if the reporting is accurate, so one needs to say that, but I've seen it reported that the author of this report has changed his mind uh, and that perhaps we should be moving to two, uh, two categories rather than uh, simply sticking with the three that we uh, have currently developed. But I'll come back to that uh, later. The other thing that's happened here in recent years, of course, has been the Supreme Court uh, litigation, uh, and particularly important uh, for some, again, which has attracted quite a lot of uh, overseas interest, uh, has been the Uber case in the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, and the Uber case, in that case, the Supreme Court uh, held, well, basically upheld all the decisions in the courts below. Uh, that the uh, the Uber drivers uh, fell within this intermediate category, so that they were entitled uh, to the benefit. Not employees, but uh, they were these intermediate so-called limb B workers, to which John referred, which meant that they would be entitled to a uh, minimum wage uh, and to uh, the protection of uh, or the right to paid holidays under the working time. Uh, legislation which uh, operates here. But in the meantime, they would be entitled by virtue of the status within this intermediate group and uh, not being deemed to be employees, they would, they would remain entitled to enjoy the benefits uh, of self-employment for the purposes uh, of uh, tax uh, legislation. Now, it's quite clear that I think the Uber case uh, doesn't uh, solve uh, the problems. I think probably government uh, had thought, I mean, one reason why, if you want to be uh, uh, generous, and why should we be, but if you want to be generous uh, to this government, I mean, one reason why they may have uh, held back on legislation is to wait to see how the, the litigation currently in train uh, uh, runs out. And they may feel that the Uber case has kind of resolved this naughty problem uh, for them. Well, the, the answer is, the response to that is that the, the, the Uber case hasn't solved the problem. Uh, in a sense, it is in some respects magnified the problem because we're up against uh, the problem of uh, continuing problem of unpredictability with similar cases being treated differently by the courts. John mentioned the Deliveroo case, uh, which uh, which uh, he has played a prominent uh, part in the Deliveroo case. The um, the Court of Appeal so far and the the, the lower courts I think uh, took the view that the workers in that case uh, were not uh, Limby workers, but uh, I guess fell within the a definition uh, of self-employment. And I think for what would be quite difficult reasons uh, for most people to uh, uh, accept uh, as, as persuasive. Another problem with, Uber, with the Uber case is that it has really had uh, one uh, quite uh, unfortunate unintended consequence uh, because uh, one effect of deeming the Uber drivers as uh, workers uh, for the purposes of uh, holiday pay and national minimum wage as falling within this, because they fall within this intermediate limb status, is that the trade union recognition legislation now applies to them, which means they could use this legislation in principle in order to get a collective agreement uh, with Uber. But what Uber have done has been to preempt uh, that uh, any such initiative on the part of the uh, Uber drivers to have their own union recognize the purpose of collective bargaining uh, and Uber have gone, it seems, the, uh, it is suggested uh, by the drive, some of the drivers that Uber have gone over the heads of the drivers and struck a, a deal uh, with uh, another union, uh, which many of the drivers feel does not represent uh, the interests of uh, uh, Uber drivers themselves. Now that may be a particular problem uh, of our labor law and it may well be that uh, that is a problem that could be resolved uh, separately by legislation, but it is an unfortunate consequence that having won this battle as to their worker status, uh, one, one effect of that is to end up with union representation, uh, which is uh, by a union over with, with which the workers themselves uh, have not uh, chosen. So that is, in a sense, the in a sense we were, I think, at a position of uh, probably stalemates at the moment, and maybe we're waiting for the Deliveroo case before we'll know which way the government 
uh, will go uh, on this. But we've had, let me just to recap, we've had these uh, recommendations, uh, which seem to be, I think, um, uh, collapsing. And we've got the uh, litigation in Uber and Deliveroo on the back of two previous Supreme Court cases. Uh, and I'm not, it's not clear to me that this litigation is actually, has actually resolved the problem. And it was interesting that the author of the 2017 government sponsored report is himself of the view that uh, legislation is still still required, which I think you know, I, I, I would agree with. So anyway, so that takes us then to uh, the approach uh, which that legislation uh, should uh, take in the sense of what we're looking at is some kind of labor law solution uh, to this uh, problem, which in our context is muddied by the problem of taxation and the overlapping uh, provisions, uh, overlapping but different provisions for uh, tax and, and labour law. But in a sense, we'd be looking for a labour law uh, solution. And I think a labour law solution, I think, begins with the principle which uh, we wrote about, I mean, three of us, John, myself and uh, Carlin, wrote in the European Journal of Labour Law, I think, uh, it's a very short piece, uh, in which the starting point should be, uh, we argue for a principle of universality, that is to say the universal protection of all workers uh, uh, for the benefits uh, which the state uh, provides. And it seems to me that there is an unanswerable case for universal protection uh, for dependent uh, workers. And if we're looking for a source for that, I think uh, I, think I tried perhaps uh, I over-egged it a bit, but I think um, we could argue that we find that principle of universality in the ILO uh, Declaration for Social Justice in uh, 2008. So the second uh, problem is to say, well, you know, problem of uh, universality, but you know, maybe we have to accept there has to be some uh, pragmatic departures from that, but so that may be true, but I don't think it applies in this case, because what is happening in the case of uh, status, this uh, three, four categorization of status, there is some evidence, I mean, anecdotal, but I've seen evidence of it personally, uh, of uh, employers uh, trying to uh, put work, put, put people who might otherwise be deemed to be employees, try to move them down the ladder, if you like, to this kind of intermediate status. We're quite happy to pay you the minimum wage. We're quite happy to pay you holiday pay but we want to avoid our liabilities for unfair dismissal uh, and redundancy. So in a sense, what seems, what, what may have been intended by the Blair government in 1998 has been something which would extend the protection uh, of uh, the national minimum wage uh, and the working time directive is being used uh, in the opposite direction in the sense of encouraging, employers encouraging people to go onto this type of contract in order to protect the employer from unfair dismissal uh, and redundancy uh, payments uh, and other uh, uh, commitments that would otherwise have to be made to the uh, workers in question. So, you know, every benign measure that is taken always has a malign consequence once employers' lawyers get to work on the measure uh, in question. So, in a sense, um, uh, and it does, I mean, I think that the third point to make at this stage, we're looking for a labour law a solution around the principle of universality. I mean, uh, I think we, we would have to acknowledge here that there is a taxation consequence that you know, more people who get swept up within the uh, employ with, within a single status, it would mean that uh, more people would be deemed to be uh, employees in the current parlance for labor law purposes. Uh, and they might, as a result, lose uh, whatever protection they have uh, in tax legislation to be treated as being self-employed. I think I mean, we, we wrestled with this for, 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 for ages when we were advising the last uh, Labour regime before the last uh, election. I think we took the view that it says we've got to do what is right for uh, employment law purposes or labour law purposes and leave it to tax law and the tax lawyers to do whatever they think is necessary or appropriate uh, for tax, uh, for, for the purposes of the tax regime. But the answer to the problem of treating uh, limb B workers uh, as, uh, as uh, the consequences of treating limb B workers as, as labor law protected. The answer to that problem, uh, in terms of there is a, it's gonna hit their income because of tax 
implications that you've got to pay people more in the sense this doesn't you know, this question of status does not operate in a vacuum it has implications for other parts of the employment relationship and the answer to this tax problem i think is to ensure that people are paid properly so that companies like uber or whoever are not then actually relying on the taxpayer to make up for or to fund the consequences of their employment practices so in a sense I mean, that, that is a price uh, of, of, of these practices in the sense as a taxpayer, the public at large, who is effectively subsidizing these particular working arrangements. And I think that that has just got to stop. And it's not a reason for saying that employment status should be trans, you know, should, 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 should apply unequivocally to, uh, to, 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 to uh, drivers or riders or whoever in the uh, gig economy. And then that takes us then to how we deal with this problem. I think John has set it out uh, in the bill and um, in his bill, uh, and I would, I, mean, I probably should stop there, but let me just say that uh, in ter terms of finding a solution, I would echo what John said, that, I mean, there isn't a, a magic bullet here. Uh, and um, I think there are people who've, you know, there are historical uh, solutions that we can perhaps look, look to. I heard a, a really powerful piece, paper by Zoe Adams, a seminar last week, who track back the truck acts uh, to find something uh, which seemed to me to be you know, interesting to work with. Uh, there are uh, there's a, a, a literature on this stuff which is just massive and impossible to keep on top of but actually one of the most persuasive pieces I ever read on the question of status was a piece read, uh, written by Adrian Stone, uh, not Adrian Stone, Adrian Brooks, sorry, Adrian Brooks in the New Zealand no, not New Zealand, New University of New South Wales Law Journal in 1982. And uh, if anybody here uh, who's working on this field, that would be a piece that would repay careful uh, study. And uh, it would be worth uh, bringing that out and giving a bit of uh, publicity uh, or, or attention. So there are, there, there is stuff out there, but I think, I mean, if you just look at the bill, um, I mean, the, the, just, to, let me just make two, two, two points. Well, one is, as I see it, there are, uh, it's basically, it's about returning to or recreating in the UK a two status solution and rejecting the three statuses that we have and um, which may seem counterintuitive to those of you who are looking in from elsewhere, attracted to this solution, but in a sense our experiences, uh, it doesn't work or, or doesn't work very well. Uh, and the second point I think which is important in the bill is to, to, to start again, a fresh start in looking at a legislated solution to this problem, which means ditching all the jurisprudence from the past, uh, coming up with a fresh solution which uh, repudiates the idea that, that your status under a particular contract uh, should be the material factor in determining uh, your eligibility for certain employment law benefits. And that the solution lies, if you look at, at the bill itself, uh, on the nature of what it is you're engaged to do. So in a sense, uh, we, should, uh, we should be working around, trying to develop a solution which, by which status is determined uh, by your engagement in the provision of labor to another, rather than the contractual basis on which that labor is provided. And I think that is the, that is the key yeah, for me, that, that is a key element uh, in this bill. It's not, as John said, it's not a solution on its own to all the problems, uh, but it was never intended to be. Yeah, and as John pointed out, there will be questions of interpretation around this. Uh, there will be uh, issues about uh, length of service requirements before you can access certain benefits. There will be qualifying conditions before you can access certain benefits. But it's around these issues, I think, that we would then focus our attention if it was thought that the access question, that the gate is, uh, of the gate itself, if we've opened the gate too widely to people uh, to get into to labor law. But at the end of the day, anybody who works for someone else as part of their business should be protected by the labor law which the state provides. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Keith. Um, yeah, a lot of these problems about tax and things sort of come up with an echo here, I think. Um, although I believe somewhere hidden in the 
review of the taxation system um, three or four years ago, there was a suggestion that the tax um, should be changed to capture dependent contractors um, so they can no longer make deductions. But in the meantime, um, let's have here the um, two New Zealand commentators. Um, and Peter, would you like to go first? Thank you very much, Gordon. Uh, Keith and John, the thing that struck me was the commonality of history and commonality of um, uh, issues. First point I wanted to comment on, Keith and John, is the, the tax issue. Uh, it is exactly the same here, that the definition of employee in our Income Tax Act, the definition of a contract of service under our GST Act, and the definition of employee under our uh, Employment Relations Act uh, don't match. So what that means is between those three, there is no commonality. One of the things that we have here, and um, uh, there will be many uh, participants who have been through this process, is our Employment Relations Act enables our first uh, court, the Employment Relations Authority first instance, to determine the real nature of the relationship. But what that means is that there is a highly factual, uh, intensive analysis of what the real relationship is, of which the, the contract, the written document, is only one part. And that's fine, and the Employment Relations Authority, or if it goes on appeal to the Employment Court, will do that analysis. But we have the issue that you've pointed out. There isn't a golden line to say this person is an independent contractor, this person is an employee. It's very much a factual analysis. So in following your legislation, the progress, uh, I, I'll be looking to see how close you can get to giving some kind of a, a golden line, I think, John, you use the word, in that grey area is to which is either. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Uh, the, the final um, comment um, from Gal. Thank you very much, um, Gordon, and, and thank you, Keith and John, for your um, speeches. It was very interesting to hear. Um, in the New Zealand context, uh, we we don't have a third category in our um, system of classifying workers as you do in the UK. However. We do often speak of a gray area of workers, which is interesting because um, the common law here is very clear that there is no gray area. If, if you look at a worker, that, that worker is either a contractor or an employee. Uh, there is a correct classification and an incorrect classification. So, um, so this, the existence of this gray area here uh, does really plague us like it does you. Um, because there are um, swathes of workers who, if you if you look at their contractual form, um, they are supposedly you know in an independent contracting relationship. But if you look at the conditions of their employment, they are in a, a relationship that's subordinate to um, to the person who they do the work for, who benefits and and profits from the work. And so, like in the UK, this. Um, this, it's not, you know, this this question of categorization is is very um, is very prevalent here. Um, but it's not just a, a technical legal problem. Of course, it has a tremendous impact on the lives of um, ordinary working people. And uh, recently, <clears throat> the government has done um, a consultation process that began, I think, in November 2019 and, and finished in 2020 in February 2020. And uh, I think the findings are publicly available and were summarized in June uh, last year. And uh, it's full of data. They've um, <clears throat> surveyed a cross section of working people over different industries. And what appears to be the case is there are um, specific industries where um, mislabeling of workers 
as contractors is an endemic problem. Um, and so some of the features, I mean, one of the, the case studies was uh, courier drivers and delivery drivers. So apparently 84% of them worked more than 45 hours a week. 51% uh, don't uh, reported not having made enough to make ends meet. 30% uh, made only um, just enough. Uh, but on the other hand, 98% uh, of them were required to wear um, company uniforms. Um, so just ostensibly presenting themselves as employees. 87% um, were not able to turn down work. 79% um, were, um, sorry, 87% uh, said that they had to work certain hours and 79% said they couldn't turn down work. Um, and uh, there were other things. So for example, a large proportion of them said that their contracts were unilaterally altered by their engager. Um, so, so it's highlighting sort of the unequal nature of the, of, of the relationship. Um, and 52% in the courier driving industry um, said that they pr were presented with standard form contracts on a take it or leave it basis with no one giving any consideration as to whether or not the, you know, the, the classification they were being given was the correct one. So similar patterns like this have been found in, in several industries, in the forestry industry, um, in, in building and construction and in franchise cleaning, for example. Um, and the issue seems to be an inherent in, imbalance of power that allows uh, employers to slice contracts in such a way as they are able to pass on to the worker the, 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 the burdens of being an independent contractor without passing on the benefits um, of, of being an independent contractor while reserving for themselves uh, the power uh, and, and, and advantages of being an employer. So they being able to direct work, for example. Um, so these workers typically pay their own tax. They don't get sick leave. Um, they don't get paid holidays. They don't get paid st uh, any statutory minimums, um, but they are, um, subject to the employer's policies, subject to the employer's direction, disciplinary codes, et cetera. So that, is the, that seems to be the fundamental problem here because system, system, um, systemically, there are whole swathes of, um, of, of, the, of the working populace who are um, unable to, um, to, to assert their, their proper classification as employees and avail themselves of those rights. Um, I also want to make a sort of very brief comment on um, a trend that I, I read about in, in one of the papers that was um, uh, disclosed prior to this this, this webinar. Uh, but a trend in, um, in in judicial court of using sort of uh, lists of um, indicia to decide um, whether someone is a, an employee or a contractor. And this approach was taken. Uh, in a, a recent case uh, involving a courier driver, Leota and Parcel Express. Um, and uh, there was um, uh, the, the list of indices basically you'd indicate yes or no as to whether or not um, a, a person met one of these criteria. And, and, and based on the balance, you could, you could decide on balance whether or not the person was an employee or a, a contractor. And, and in, in, in the Leota case is very interesting for lots of reasons because it sort of exemplifies the intensely factual uh, approach that, um, that we take in, in sort of um, determining the real nature of employment, but, um, but also for the use of this, this, this um, set of um, criteria. And some of the um, criteria that, uh, that were, were used um, ask questions like, does the worker bear any risk of loss? Um, if, if yes, then, then they're more likely to, or the, the, that, that counts as, indicating contractor status, if no employee. Uh, another question, does the worker receive paid holidays or sick leave? Um, if yes, an employee, if no contractor. Uh, is taxation deductible by the hirer or by the worker's pay? Um, again, yes or no, yes being, um, well, if it's the hirer, it's the employee, if it's the, con um, the worker, it's the contractor. Um, but these list using lists like this, um, I think exposes us to some sort of distorted outcomes if we can't be informed by the fact that there's an underlying power imbalance. Because a worker 
who has signed a contract that says that they will not receive sick leave and they will not receive um, paid um, annual holidays um, may have signed that contract because of precisely what I described before, the contract being sliced in such a way as they have all these burdens um, of being independent contractors without any of the actual independence, while the, the engager has the advantages of being an employer without any of the obligations of being an employer. So I think we have to be sort of careful about uh, very formulaic approaches that I think in the words of um, one of the papers that I read might um, create distorted and unreal outcomes. Um, so I think focusing on the, the reality of the relationship is a good feature of our um, employment law. And I think there's, there's, there are things to, to do um, to try and uh, improve uh, those golden uh, lines between contractorship and um, employer uh, employee status. But, um, but I think those are things we need to retain. And I'm, I, I'm, I just wanted to comment a little bit on that trend of using um, lists uh, of indications um, to very formulaically determine uh, whether someone is one thing or another. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gail. Um, would you mind um, putting a reference to that paper you were referring to on the um, chat, which um, someone has asked if you could do? Um, we had a couple of comments um, on the chat. Um, one was about Uber drivers, um, but <clears throat> pos uh, possibly the, um, I'll do the other sort of main one first. Um, and it's essentially, um, should, we should we sort of try focusing on limited reforms for things like platform workers or go for the sort of um, larger scale reforms that are being suggested as a, I suppose, as a question of political tactics, which I think partly answers, um, addresses the other question about Uber as well. But I just wondered if anyone had any comments on, I suppose, legislative tactics. Well, isn't it a question of doing um, everything, belt and braces, if you've got the capacity and the political clout to do it? I mean, why, why not change the definitions and, and also look at it on a sectoral basis? I mean, that's, that's, that's the, historically, that is the solution that was uh, uh, adopted in Britain, which was quite stable, apart from peripheral cases in relation to employment status in, from the uh, Second World War, really, up until the 1970s. I mean, there was litigation, of course there was, but... Um, I mean, take the example of dock work, which was entirely casual. All right, they weren't ranked as self-employed. Nobody ever tested it. But but whether whatever it was, it was dealt with by uh, legislation specific to that industry. And uh, so were the wages councils that we had in our in our country. Uh, which were imposed by statute where sectoral collective bargaining was binding by law on all the employers and all the workers in the industry and had to regulate uh, all the different kinds of wage rates and various other aspects of terms and conditions in agriculture dealt with how much employers could charge for tied housing and all that sort of thing. There was even a dog allowance for um, agricultural workers, so that 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 would be another another way of doing it. But I, I would advocate pulling every lever you've got. Um, great. Um, well, I think we've probably run out of time about um, this point. Um, so, um, can on behalf of everyone, uh, thank you. Um, particularly um, John and Keith for giving us this sort of insight into what's going on um, in the United Kingdom. Um, as you should have noted from the comments, it's all obviously incredibly relevant here and pretty much everywhere else, I think. And you know, um, not that it's not only the core problem, but the very um, problems associated with it. Um, we still have ongoing Uber legislation, uh, sorry, Uber litigation here to try and determine that um, E2 have sort of got another, um, um, so they say in the chat have got um, another representative case going, although we've 
had one unfortunate result already on that. Um, but the, uh, it's obviously a thing that's still very up and down, variations in the courts and um, possibly a statutory um, solution of this would at least get rid of some problems, probably create a lot of new problems, but it's um, great to hear your views on that. So thank you um, very much um, for um, staying up late to speak to us and thank you for everyone in um, <clears throat> other places who got up early. So um, thank you. And we can't clap, but um, we would if we could. <laughs>